Good morning. Captain America needs to shave. <laughs> oh, it is great to be with you. I love your church. I love your pastors. I love your founding pastor. My name is Brett, and we don't get many opportunities to fellowship like this, meaning pastors on a Sunday morning, because we're doing what we do. We're working hard, trying to build a kingdom and stand in, in our place on the wall. But your pastor uh, graciously invited me at the beginning of the year. He said, oh, I, I need you to come and talk. And I said, I'll be happy to. And um, we developed a really wonderful relationship. Uh, not just, the relationship we have is not just one between two pastors, but it's one between generations. He mentioned that I was uh, in friendship or connection with his dad. It's it's fairly deep. So I was 21 when I came here in 1982 to help start the church that I now pastor. I did not become pastor until 1991. The senior pastor was a man named Mark Koch. And Mark was from South Carolina, just like your founding pastor. Mark pastored a church in Columbia, South Carolina. Your pastor was in Greenville. They knew one another. I was raising my support because the church couldn't support me. So I was a missionary to Howard University, reaching out to the college campuses there. My pastor talked to your pastor and said, could this man come and present what he's doing at Howard University and see if anybody wants to support? You all were meeting in an elementary school. No, the people who were here were meeting in an elementary school. You all weren't here. <laughs> 1982, September, November, someplace in there. Uh, Maybe it was the spring of 83, I can't remember, but Pastor Harley invited me in, had me present, and that church that could not have been more than 20 people supported me $25 a month. Your church, $25 a month for two years. Phenomenal. When I became senior pastor, uh, we had, as a congregation, moved 33 times. From 1982 to 2004, when we found our first building, we had moved 20, 33 times. Now, it's hard to build a church when you don't know where you're going to meet that given Sunday. <laughs> I don't, the, 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 that we are in existence is a miracle. It's a miracle. And 33 times, 33 different locations are only the ones I can remember. I went to Pastor Arley. I was so frustrated as a pastor. I couldn't find a place for my people. I felt... I felt impotent, I felt irresponsible as a pastor because I couldn't find a home. And I knew your pastor had an anointing on buildings. He had a grace on buildings. And I knew about this thing, Elisha, Elisha, somebody laying hands on somebody and anointing can be transferred. I said, hey, can I please meet with you, Pastor Early? And can you pray for me? Because I don't feel good at all about the way I'm leading my church. I need help. I can't find a place for us to meet. He graciously met with me, laid hands on me. Within six months, I had two buildings. I'm not, I'm not kidding. With no more effort on my part than I had normally done. It was the grace of God through your pastor that helped us. Now, the buildings that I bought, one of them was sketchy. <laughs> For those of you who have been around here a little bit, you go down 28, where we now call church, used to be a water park. We bought that. And when I came to my people and said, hey, we bought a water park, they went, you what? You bought a what? I said, just stay with me on this, please. Uh, and Pastor Arley was excited because he realized the location. He didn't care what it was previously used for. He said, that location is fabulous. Great job. How did, he said, how'd you buy it? It wasn't even for sale. I said, you laid hands on me. That's how I bought it. And since then, we've been able to purchase more properties. I love your founding pastor, and I love his family, and I love your pastor. Lots of history I can't go into more because I don't have time, but just to say thank you for what you all have been to us as a people. Um, a little bit of history about who I am. I'm married to my beautiful bride, Cynthia. In 35 years, it'll be in December, and we've got seven kids. Uh, 
uh, and my oldest is 33, my youngest is 21, graduating this May from Liberty University. Three of my children are in ministry with me in the church, not hired by me, hired by other people who said, those folk, we need to work. They are so good, we must pay them to do what they're doing. And my fourth, who is a senior graduating, will be taking over for my son, who is a, a youth pastor, and will be taking over for me here next year. So I'll have four ministry. Really happy about that. Am I not doing well? Having an issue with that mic. So what do I just go ahead and talk into this one? Okay, I can do that. Um, train of thought lost. So turn with me over to First Chronicles four. First Chronicles four. The title of my message is "A City's Hope." A city's hope. First Chronicles 4, we're going to look at a, at a familiar passage. First Chronicles 4, 9 through 10. It says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother named him Jabez, saying, because I bore him with pain. Verse 10, now Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, that it may not pain me. And God granted him what he requested. Lord, help us as we study your word. There are three things in this passage about which I'd like to speak. One, aspired living. Two, affliction-filled birthing. And three, how to properly ask God. We've got a, a beautiful kind of respite from the reason most people want to skip the first four chapters or five of Chronicles because most of it is just he lived and beget so and so and he lived and beget so and so and he died who begets so and so and then he died who begets so and so and you think can I Lord I know I'm supposed to treat all your scriptures right can I skip this part I'm just, I'm just, I'm, it's in my daily reading. I got to read four chapters a day to get through the entire Bible. And, and is this really important? <laughs> but if you skip this part, you miss this part. And it's kind of a picture because up to, up to this point, this is the way most of humanity is. They live, they beget, and they die. Not much of significance happens, whereby there needs to be a note in Scripture that's saying they were pretty incredible. Because they did not aspire to anything of greatness. They, satis they were satisfied with mediocrity, or they lived in the compliance, the way the world would normally just evolve and move and flow. They didn't rock the boat. They didn't do anything significant. All they did was just live and die and create, hopefully, some kids that were moral, not criminals, at least did not take away from society, but added nothing to their society. They lived, they beget, and they died. And then all of a sudden, there's somebody who sticks his head up above mediocrity. I'm praying to God that all of you are like this one. That there's something about your life that's worth writing about other than the fact of your birth and your death. That you strive for something in God that allows you to be talked about after you're gone in wonderful ways. That there's so many people at your funeral that they have to shut it off because they, they, they want to say something so much and so good. Standing in line to try to talk about you. By the way, I get loud when I get excited, so just <laughs> FYI. Okay. Here we have Jabez. Something's different about him, and it required more ink. May your life require more ink. Do something. Now, it doesn't have to be qualified to do what I do. You don't have to be a preacher, because there's nothing in this passage that says that Jabez was ordained. He didn't go to seminary. He didn't graduate from Bible school. This was a man who just woke up one day and said, whatever I've got going in my family, this mediocrity thing that's happened in my generations, I don't want to stand for it anymore. 
There's got to be something more for me. God's looking for availability. He's not looking for, for somebody who is so talented and gifted. Because even the most talented and gifted aren't near as good as they ought to be in order to do what he needs to do. We still need him to accompany us in everything that we do. There is nothing about our lives, nothing about our competencies that would somehow commend us to God as being those he would choose above others because we are so wonderful. Saying to himself, there's no way I can accomplish what needs to be done in the world without you. Please understand, your God is better than you at everything. <laughs> Anything that needs to be done, he can do it better. The only reason he's choosing you is for fellowship. And he doesn't even need that. He just loves you. He just wants you to be around him. And generally, it takes much longer for him to ask you to do stuff when you do it. Much longer to accomplish. My daughter was four years old. And my wife bought a, a thing that's, that stands up over the commode pretty shelves and you put stuff on it. Stuff women care about that we men don't. <laughs> and and, and it, it, it came in a box and it required assembly. Now, I'm not good at putting stuff together. Generally speaking, when I put stuff together, there are parts left over. That's not good. <laughs> so I'm sitting there working this thing and my daughter, Brooke, who's four, she's 25 now, came to me and said, uh, Daddy, can I help you? <laughs> now, the practical side of me worked it really fast in my brain. You helping me is going to take twice as long. You can't help me. You're four. <laughs> this thing I know, it says it's supposed to take 20 minutes, which means 40 for me, even without your help, which means it's going to take me an hour to do it with your help. But my daddy side kicked in rather than my practical side. And I said, absolutely, baby. Come on. And I taught her how to do uh, clockwise to tighten the screw, counterclockwise, the difference between a nut and a bolt. I taught her everything. It was great. And it did take an hour. <laughs> We're four. When God asks us to participate, when we volunteer, it's not because he needs our help. It's because he wants to build something more than just the shelf. Are you listening to me? Jabez picked his head up above the morass of mediocrity and said, I'll be used by you. Let me do something great. Let me do something great. And the interesting thing is he had a lot of obstacles. He not only aspired to something magnificent, but it says that his mother named him Jabez because she birthed him in pain, bore him in pain. Now, the interesting thing about his name is that, is that in Hebrew, it is the phonetic reversal of the consonants. So Jabez in Hebrew is Yatseb. Pain in Hebrew is Atseb. So Yabet, excuse me, Jabez in Hebrew is Yabetz, and pain in Hebrew is Atseb. Phonetic reversal of the consonants, which gives you the sense of this. You know, boy, you, you didn't come out as easy as I thought you were supposed to. It says she bore him in pain. I don't know if it meant that it was nine months of difficulty or it was the kind of pain that all of us experience after our children are born. <laughs> that we still have to bear them. And it doesn't come with great ease. Oh, it doesn't mean, kids, don't get mad at me thinking, that, wow, he's talking bad about the second generation. I love the second generation. It's just that when you're the first generation, you realize that you've got some work to do to raise these kids right. And it is not easy. It requires labor, tears, effort, telling folk to do, th do th things two and three times, and they never get done. <laughs> Trying to figure out what were you thinking? I wasn't. No kidding. <laughs> we bear them in pain for 18 years until they're out of the house. Now, that used to be the standard. When I was 17, I left home. 
I, I went to college and never came home except for holidays. Today it takes till about 37. <laughs> I'm not quite sure when they're mature enough to get out of the house. My wife and I have decided there will be no empty nest for us. We are going to have to move. <laughs> in pain in pain I don't know if it was nine months or the lifestyle that they lived we do know this and most Hebrew mothers did not name their children until they developed a personality so that they understood exactly what they were to be called sometimes it would take two or three years they'd be baby boy so and so and then they realized so we're not quite sure when Jabez got his name Yabetz got his name but we do know that she said on the basis of how I feel about you, what you took me through, I'm going to name you after the pain. Now, I've had seven kids. None of them have been so painful that it inspired me to name them pain. <laughs> so this one here, <laughs> wow, like wow. But it could be this because she phonetically reversed it. She said this, it's been hard on you and me, but I want you to know that this does not have to define you. So I want you to know I'm going to reverse it in your name. You will never be defined by this. You're going to be Yabetz rather than Atzeb. And there's no question that life has not dealt any of us the kind of cards that we would desire, that all of us have had things that came to us that were untoward, and we've had to figure out how in the world do I navigate I didn't plan for this. Maybe your parents weren't as they should be. And that was compounded by you not being as you should be. Maybe you had friends that treated you really poor. Maybe coaches didn't treat you as well as they should. Maybe you've had tragedy in your life that you could not navigate through. You, all of us have been, have been birthed into difficulty in this world because Adam and Eve set the table. And it's been hard for us to grab the cross and find redemptive benefit in all of our difficulty. And so we, we struggle through life, asking God for help every moment. But we cannot, should not, let that pain define us. Most of my life has been full of pain, yet the kind of pain that I, I, I wouldn't even want to talk about with respect to what, say, Paul went through. Been, been pressed, pressed down, but not destroyed. I, 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 I've been perplexed, but I haven't been just in despair. Nothing about Paul's life was comfortable. 30 years of ministry and probably four and a half in prison? Like, wow. And part of that, he chose. Just about all of it he chose. Because they would tell him, you know, you go into the city, you're going to get beat up, and it's going to be real bad. And he said, I know. You're not telling me anything new. You might be a good prophet, but all you did was turn your dial to hear the stuff I've been listening to ever since I got saved. Ananias was told by God, when, when Paul got saved, he said, go tell him all the things he must suffer for me. How about that prophetic word? You want something from God? That's generally not what you want to hear. You're going to suffer for the rest of your days. So whatever suffering I've been through is not even close, but whatever suffering you've been through probably is a lot like what I've been through, and I don't want to minimize it because it's still painful in here, if not in here. But we cannot let whatever we've been through define us. Boy, listen, it's been hard, but I'm going to let you know through your name every day, you can reverse that thing. You can reverse it. You can see God leverage your pain for good. Y'all bets? Yabetz, that's what I'm going to call you, rather than Atzeb. He was able to take the pain of his life. This was not a kid who had a silver spoon in his mouth when he was born. He had to work through some stuff. And our God is best at helping us work through stuff. If we will surrender, the most difficult tragedy through which you've been can be the leverage for your greatness. Are you listening to me? And on the basis of that, he said, my, my, mama, my mama seems to think I can reverse this thing, so, so let me be specific. Let me be specific about how I think God wants me to reverse my pain, leverage it for greatness. Lord, 
I'm asking you to bless me. Now, generally, God doesn't answer prayers that are unbiblical. If they're not according to his will, you can pretty much forget about it. I know there's that passage in John where it says, ask anything, if, ask anything you will in my name, it'll be done for you. And people generally ask the wrong stuff, thinking that that gives them a blank check. And as long as they slap the name of Jesus on the prayer, somehow it's going to be answered. It doesn't work like that. He means ask anything under the authority of my name, which has already been approved. It's already been approved. So when you ask, it's going to be done for you. Generally, God doesn't bless those things that aren't his will. So we see when God says at the end of this passage, and the Lord granted him what he asked for, that Jabez was asking not only the right thing, but in the right way. Lord, bless me. In the Hebrew, the word blessed is the word barach. Now, the word barach in the Hebrew is very close to another word, the word barach. And the word barach is the word bend the knee. In the Hebrew mind, when somebody was blessed, it meant they obviously had bent the knee. It meant to bow, the second one, barach. And because they sounded like homonyms, they were very close in, in the way they, they appeared as they came out of the mouth, sounded as they came out of the mouth. Everybody thought that if you were blessed by God materially, you must have bent the knee. Abraham had so much stuff. Why? Because he obeyed. And as a result of his obedience, God blessed him. He bowed his heart and will to the will of God. And as a result, the Lord brought about material blessing for him. This is why the disciples couldn't figure out why the rich young ruler couldn't be a part of them. He was generally the kind of church member every pastor would want. Comes to Jesus. Luke 19, it says, Lord, what should I do? What, what am I lacking to be saved? Jesus said, you know the commandments. And Jesus listed basically the last five, which are all about human interaction, nothing to do with God. He didn't list the very last one, so he listed, I guess, six through nine. The last one is covetousness out of the ten. So Jesus talked about adultery, murder, steal. And he said, I've kept all that stuff. I'm good at that. Mm. The one thing you lack, uh, take all your possessions, sell them, and then give the proceeds to the poor. Then you are eligible to follow me. And the man went away very sad. And the disciples were thinking, why are you making it so hard on the brother? <laughs> I don't know. Why, 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 why? Jesus said, well, it's hard for a rich man to get through to the kingdom. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to come into the kingdom. And the disciples were thinking, wait, 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 wait. Uh, blessing. Is, is analogous to worship. I mean, the man had money. He must have done right. That's how close these two words were. And so when, when Jabez says, bless me, he's not just saying, give me stuff. He's saying, grant me the privilege of bowing my knee. Help me to understand who you are better. Let my will be subject to yours. Help my mind to think your thoughts, not my own. Bless me like that. Help me to get in line with who you are so I can receive that which you want me to receive. I don't want you so I can get it. I'd rather have you if I can't have it. But if I can get you and it, I'll be really blessed. So I'm trusting, Lord, that you are going to bless me like that. Listen to me. This kind of prayer can be prayed by you. There is nothing wrong with praying this kind of prayer if you pray it with the right attitude. And God says he gave him what he, what he asked for. This was a man who had overcome some stuff in his own life to believe that his life could be different, and he found God in the midst of it. We don't even have any record that any of his family members were worshipers. Genetically in line with Abraham, absolutely. But sometimes that just didn't matter very much every day. You had, to be, you had to be somebody different who actually wanted to connect with God to get something different than everybody else had. And here was Jabez crying out without any kind of template, saying, Lord, do something different with me. Bless me that I might be yours and that you might give me yours. Secondly, he says, enlarge my territory. <laughs> I 
I had pastors come to me and uh, uh, probably once every six weeks and they, they're either trying through email or to get an appointment to interview with my staff and figure out how in the world they can grow your, their church to a large church, what it means to really impact the community. And the first thing I do is ask them, say, so like you really, you really want to have a, a big church? You want to see a lot of people born again, not just transfers from other congregations? You want to reach out and, and actually see folks added to the kingdom? You want to have a lot of people? He said, absolutely. I said, okay. Um, you know people have problems, right? You know that. So what you're asking for is a lot of problems. That's what you're asking for, a lot of problems. So um, I, I just know from experience that everybody who comes to my church, into my church, has a lot of baggage. Everybody has baggage when they come into the kingdom. And, and, and what you hope when they come into the church is that it's just a carry-on. <laughs> That's what you hope. But when they come into my church, it's like I hear the beep of the U-Haul van moving backwards. <laughs> beep, beep, beep. Oh, welcome. Come on in. I'm tempted to say, have you tried community church? <laughs> when you ask God to enlarge your territory, you're asking for more work. It's a responsibility to steward more. You're saying, you're saying make, increase my hours of the day. Let the capacity of my soul grow. Somehow during this COVID moment, we forgot about this prayer. Most folks' worlds have shrunk. Decrease my territory. Let it be just me and my computer screen. Me and my house. Me and my car. I'll run to the grocery store and back. In fact, I'll door dash all my meals. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll peapot all my groceries. I will make my world really small. They're going the opposite direction rather than increase. We as a congregation during the pandemic have decided to increase. We are intentionally militating against the culture. It doesn't mean we are irresponsible. We haven't had one positive uh, contact, not one positive contact from any of our Sunday morning gatherings, none. We are careful. We, we will mask up. We will social distance. We will do all of that. We've met for the last 15 months since the governor allowed us, and we have met faithfully. God has blessed us, and for that we're grateful. Having said that, we are not moving backwards. We're moving forwards. We have actually bought property. We bought property downtown. We are planting churches. We're, we're, we just signed a contract on another piece of property la, uh, t uh, three days ago. We are moving forward. We're saying, God, in this moment, enlarge us. Increase our influence. We have 1,100 volunteers who are out in the community, not inside, out in the community, trying to figure out how to distribute food, clothing, whatever needs our community has. We have distributed 8.5 million pounds of food in the last 15 months to the community. I'm not looking for a pat on the back. I'm just letting you know. We are asking him to enlarge when everybody else is trying to shrink down. You who are at home, I get it. I'm not trying to step on your COVID toes and all of the things that you believe are most important to keeping you safe. I'm not trying to do that. I respect your convictions, but I want you to know that even in the midst of this, this here is part of your territory. Don't give it up. Increase and figure out a way for God to protect you in the middle of it. Now, I know that there have been a lot of people who have tried and say, well, God will protect us, and they got COVID and died. I get it. But a 1,000 may fall in my right hand, then 10,000 in my side, but it will not come near me. I trust my God every day to be able to believe that he can protect me through this. And I don't, I don't have a whole lot of over-concern. If I go, at least I, I went doing something for the gospel. Amen. I just don't care much about my health. Now, having said that, I, I drink kombucha. <laughs> the 
It's nasty. It's just, just that like nasty. It's nasty. I, I, I exercise an hour a day. So I care for my health like that. I don't want to shoot holes in my own boat. But if I have to go out preaching the gospel and put myself in harm's way, happy to do it. Happy to do it. Enlarge my territory. Give me more work. That your hand may be with me. Oh, he didn't want to do it by himself. He wanted to do it with the Father. He wanted God's accompaniment to be his and that talks about fellowship. Lord, I need you with me every moment. Relationship. I don't want to go out and just work this thing. I, I want you to be with me every moment so that when things happen, people feel the presence of God with me in, in the middle of it. They don't just think that's a, su a successful son of Abraham. They actually think that your covenant is working with me and your hand of promise, your presence is with me. I don't want to do this without you. I, I'm acting like Moses. Lord, I don't want to go up if your presence does not go with us. Relationship with God. We have no record that anybody else in his family had this. But he was reaching above the level of mediocrity. And lastly, that it may not harm me. That it may not harm me. Now, this prayer, as you go through it, sounds a whole lot like the kind of prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Bless me. Give us, our, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from... I think Jesus read his Old Testament. Now, he can coin anything he wants because he's Almighty God. But he, I think he read his Old Testament and lifted some things from this prayer and told the disciples as, as the disciples were trying to figure out how to pray, just add a little Jabez into your life. Help me to go in a direction and make decisions whereby it doesn't hurt me later. Keep me out of sin. Don't listen to me. This is a great, this is a great ending to the prayer. Lord, I know my tendencies. I understand how I might go wrong. I know my mind. I know the, the, the strength of my flesh. I want you to know today, I am submitting myself fully to you because I don't want to do anything that I'm going to have to pay for tomorrow. I don't want to enjoy the moment that might cost me years of agony later. Keep me out of stupid. Help me not to go dumb. Help me to stay right and don't exit too early off the road. Lord, don't let me make dumb decisions. Don't let my flesh lead even though it might feel right for the moment. The consequences will be too great to bear later. Keep me out of sin. Lead me not into temptation. And deliver me from evil. What a great prayer. And it says that God answered his request. May this congregation have this kind of attitude. That it might rise above the morass of mediocrity. In spiritual uh, enjoyment and, and enjoyment. Not it, I'm talking about being apart. Not being happy. Spiritual, I-N-J-O-I-N. Enjoyment that we rise above the level of mediocrity and enjoin ourselves to our community that we might make a difference out there. Enlarge this church's territory. And may the hand of God be with you in every moment and keep you out of the wrong way so that you will be most fruitful and not have any consequences down the road. Father in heaven, I'm asking for your blessing upon these people that you would empower them this is our city's hope that we have congregations like this. Bless this people, O oh Lord. Pour out your grace on them and empower them to be great every day. Is there anybody this morning who has yet to give their heart to Christ? Maybe you made a decision in the past, but your life doesn't look anything like what a believer's ought to be. And today you want to make a change. You want to come home. Anybody at all today, you want to make that decision. Raise your hand high. If that's you, I see that hand. Bless you. Once it's up, you can put it down. Anybody else? You online. I'm sure there's a place there in the chat where you can begin to, to say, I, I, I'm trying to make a change in my life. If you want that today, pray with me. 
Pray this prayer. Say, Father in heaven, forgive me. I am sorry for the way I've lived. I choose to turn away from everything I know to be sin and to follow you with all of my heart. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for giving me the privilege of calling Jesus the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. What a great service. Amazing music, incredible sermon. Perhaps something in today's service moved you and you're ready to take a next step in your faith. Did you make a commitment to follow Christ? Maybe you even clicked that small hand emoji on the Church Online platform. You know, taking that next step to follow Christ is as simple as praying and saying yes. Yes to God's love and God's forgiveness. You can take a moment right now and pray that prayer in whatever words you choose. But don't wait another moment. Invite God's love into your life. We want to support you in whatever decision you've made today, so please text the word CONNECT to our church phone number, and someone from our ministry team will reach out to you soon. We also want to thank you for partnering with us financially. If you'd like to give, it's as simple as texting the word GIVE to our church phone number. Don't forget to join us next week a few minutes early so that we can chat and catch up and even share some surprises. See you guys next week.